So before I get started, um, just a little context. I'm Nick. Um, I'm an instructor at Maker Square, so I teach web development um, sort of across the street on Brazos there. Um, some of my students are here to uh, watch me talk about something that I'm as brand new to as they are to web development. Uh, I just started looking into Clojure like a couple months ago, and I've done all the colors, and I've gone through foreclosure and all of this stuff. And foreclosure is like, the easy ones are really hard for me. So it takes me quite a while to get through uh, some of these things. But um, so the little application I built is just like the first thing I built that actually compiled and did something um, in Clojure. Um, and it's essentially a web application. This is not it. This is a chat service called Slack that we use at my job for students and instructors to uh, communicate with one another. And sort of in tooling around with it, um, <clears throat> I found out that uh, it has a lot of really cool integrations. So you can have like GitHub sort of like notify you in a channel. It's sort of set up like IRC, but it is not actually IRC. Um, it's actually just a big web application. Um, and so you can have GitHub sort of notify you if something has happened uh, on a repository that you're watching and Circle CI will let you know if the latest build was successful and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I thought it would be an interesting opportunity to just sort of like play around with uh, their web hooks and all the stuff that they have set up there. And initially, it seemed like a really easy thing to do in Ruby and Sinatra, like I'm a Ruby guy, and it would have taken me about like five minutes to build this thing in Ruby. Uh, instead, it took me like five weeks to do it in Clojure, um, with three of those weeks being beating my head against the wall over the deployment issue. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about the deployment issue and a little bit about my code. Um, this application, really, um, that's it right there. It's called Technobot. Um, Can you if, bump the font? I don't remember. Yes, a little oh, bit. There we go. Whoa, that's good. Ah. Cool. See if I can uh, Yeah, just get rid of So yes, Technobot. There he is. He's got his German flag. Uh, I'm a huge fan of techno music, especially if it comes from Germany or Scandinavia. Uh, and so I uh, created this techno enthusiast channel on our uh, our our chat room here, and I thought it would be cool if somebody could say, like, hey, Technobot, like, YouTube such and such song and have Technopod like present to you the song. Um, and so that's pretty much all he does. And actually, I think uh, if you ask Technopod for the weather, um, <laughs> yeah, he'll respond. So the current temperature in Austin is 84 with 61% humidity. Um, that feels a little off. I'm pretty sure it's working with that outside. But anywho. <clears throat> so I'm a big fan of Prezi's, even though they're kind of weird. Um, so yeah, Doku plus closure equals happiness. So writing the application took like a little while for me. Um, Lisps and JVM and all of that is sort of new to me. I'm like, really like a Ruby guy, JavaScript and all that. Um, so this experience was quite the adventure. I discovered that uh, deploying onto Heroku, well, first I thought I wanted to deploy the application on Heroku. I thought, you know, Heroku's got all the build packs and everything set up and that would be pretty easy to do. Then I thought, what if I like build this thing out and it gets like really enormous. Um, eventually Heroku's gonna become like sort of expensive. Um, and so I thought I'd just pay the five bucks for a digital ocean droplet and figure out something there. Um, but then I'm, I'm really accustomed to the sort of get push Heroku way. So, um, <clears throat> I found this super awesome tool called Doku. Has anybody heard of Doku or used Doku? You have, because it helps me with this. Um, so Doku is actually really cool. It's uh, created by a guy named Jeff Lindsay, uh, who created two other tools that are part of the project called Git Receive and uh, Build Step. And the whole project um, is comprised basically of Docker, Git Receive, and Build Step. And it's about, aside from those three uh, applications, they're big ones, um, it's really just about 100 lines of like shell scripts. Um, the first sort of important, most important part of the application is Docker. Um, I don't know if you've used Docker before. I have not actually used Docker at all um, until I started this process. Um, I was originally under the impression that Docker was just like a sort of another way of handling a virtual machine or actually a virtual machine itself and it is in fact not um, it really it's just a process that runs on a host machine and everything is sort of nicely sandboxed into that process and all that's inside of it um, is essentially just your application and any of its dependencies so you end up with a much sort of like smaller footprint um, in your host machine there um, so you don't have to have like a sort of second operating system installed or anything like that so Docker's kind of cool. And what I like about all this too, um, 
is that all of this stuff is open source. I try to use a lot of open source software like as much as I can just because I like to, I don't know, support people's hard work. I think it's pretty cool that people spend a lot of time on all this. And Jeff Lindsay spends a lot of time on this if you go into his GitHub profile and just check it out. It's like commits all day, every day for these projects. <clears throat> So one of the other parts of Dohu is something called Build Step. It's another, I think I got kicked off. <laughs> How lame. Um, I'll get up there. But um, Build Step uh, is another sort of like series of shell scripts um, that's part of Dohu. Um, it uses the Heroku build packs to basically like put your application together. Um, if you've deployed to Heroku before, you know you just sort of like get push and then all of this sort of magic happens in the background and it builds up your application. Um, and the people at Heroku were nice enough to make all of those build packs open source and so people in the community can help maintain them. Um, which is also kind of nice because if Heroku decided they didn't want that stuff to be public anymore, it's, it's still like, it's out there. So um, if you're de deploying closure applications, um, Doku's gonna make it like super, super easy. And there are build packs for like, lots of different languages. If you wanted to do, you know, Ruby or Scala, PHP, if you're into that kind of thing, um, it's all out there, so it's pretty sweet. Um, and the last sort of like, the part that really makes it all feel really magical is Git Receive, again, a series of shell scripts um, that basically creates an empty repo on your host machine um, when you git push, you don't have to sort of set anything up uh, in advance aside from just like git receives own dependencies, which is sshd and git, really. Um, it uses this pre-receive hook basically to trigger the build pack. So when it receives your code, um, it tells the build pack like, hey, here's some code, here's the path to uh, like, in the case of, again, I got kicked off. But in the case of uh, a closure application, it's gonna look for your project.clj file um, and sort of build everything out from there. And so git receive uh, basically triggers that. It triggers the build pack to sort of do its thing. So Slack was what I was talking about before. That's the chat service that we use at MakerSquare, or like one of the many chat services that we use at MakerSquare. And originally when I got on it, I was I thought it was IRC. And I like originally when I was like 12 years old, I, my interest in programming started with trying to make IRC bots. Um, and so I was like, sweet, I could make another IRC bot for this little uh, thing that we're using. And then upon like, you know, just a cursory glance at the API, it turns out that, you know, it's not IRC at all. In fact, it's just a web application, and if you want to uh, sort of get messages out of Slack, it's not, it, what's really uncool about it that I like about making a proper IRC bot is that with a proper IRC bot, you get to sort of watch everything that happens and you can respond to whatever you want. Um, but with Slack, you have to sort of have these pre-configured uh, keywords that when something is said in a certain place, it'll send a like post request to wherever you want. Um, and so essentially you have to set up your own sort of API to receive these webhooks from Slack. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is an example of what the params look like. Um, at first, well actually the next slide I'll talk about it, but um, the ones that I'm mostly concerned with for the time being um, are username and text. Um, my keyword that sort of triggers it is just technobot. If you say technobot, um, it will send the entire line of text. And I don't think, although I haven't really played with it yet, I don't think it really matters where in technobot you say it, uh, or where in the line you say technobot, you just have to say it. Is that your real token? This is not my real token. I screenshotted that from their API. So oh. yes, not, not my real token. Although, Thank you for saving me hours tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> although, actually, I, I might have something top secret in there. Um, so, all right, building, essentially what I had to do was build like a web application um, in Clojure. And so I figured I would just, originally I started with Luminous and Luminous like, it, I don't know if you guys have used Luminous or you've seen it before, but you have, it, um, it comes with like a ton of crap that I didn't need. Um, I realized like immediately, just looking at the project CLJ file, it's like, I don't even know what half of these things are, but they don't seem like they'd be super useful to me. Um, so I ended up going with um, just using the Composure template that Linegan provides, uh, which actually is somewhat dangerous, and I'll get to what the problem I had was with that, that Norman and I figured out, or really Norman figured it out after a very long time of looking at uh, this issue. But um, one of the things I kind of like about building a web application in Clojure, I do this in like Rails and Sinatra all day long, and so I'm very used to like that way of doing things. Um, 
but it turns out Composure makes some of this like super, super easy. Um, if we go back a second, actually, so these are the params that come in. Um, originally, if you don't sort of have that wrap params thing, um, sort of at the bottom of your file, you say like wrap params, def routes, um, it'll say, essentially what will come in is just this like string. And I didn't have wrap params in there, so I got this like massive string that was basically just this all on a single line. Um, and I was going through trying to figure out with like regular expressions how to parse it and that's just like there's no fucking way this is like the way it's supposed to be like I, people who are very intelligent use closure I can't imagine that like this is how they want it to work um, and so that was when I found out about wrap params um, and if you use wrap params I think by default actually the composure template had it uh, sort of wrapping its JSON which was the original problem. Um, so when I changed it to wrap params, it allows you to sort of get at the uh, the entire request, and the request is sort of structured into a map. Um, and what's really nice about it is that uh, if you set up this little vector here with um, with sort of two symbols, I guess, username and text, it will go into the uh, request map, and it will find those symbols and bind them, bind their values. Uh, to these ones here, and then I have a little function inside my uh, my core file called process incoming webhook, and it just passes in the username and the text, and it sort of figures out what are we gonna do uh, with this information. So yeah, don't forget wrap params. And Dar, who's not here, actually warned me about wrap params. He was like, you gotta wrap all the stuff for your params, you're gonna be a total mess, and I did not heed his warning, or at least I He's forgot. He's watching from uh, Dar, thank you, even though I ignored you. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so another thing uh, that I had to deal with sort of for the first time working with like an actual closure application and not just doing exercises online were uh, environment variables. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, the environment uh, library makes that super, super easy. I think I may not have actually needed this sort of, I sort of namespaced it with environ there. I think you can actually just do env and forget about it. Um, but there's a, uh, there's a file that exists uh, in the root of my application that has all the environment variables in it and so when it compiles everything is uh, nicely set up if you don't want to deal with that file and so originally the way I set this up was that I had that file with all of my environment variables in it and then I was like all right I'm gonna push this code to github and then I was like all right well I can't do that because here's this file with all the API keys and all the other stuff in it um, so I had to sort of ignore it for the time being and figure out uh, how am I going to get my environment variables sort of you know, onto the host machine so that this application can actually do something? Um, and then I remembered that Doku really is supposed to be like Heroku Lite, you sort of host it yourself, and Heroku just has a really nice command where you do Heroku config set, um, and actually you don't need to state your application name for Heroku. Um, but essentially it looks something very similar to this, what's going on here on the top line. Um, so with Doku, you just say Doku config, con, uh, config set the name of your application, whatever the uh, name of the variable is and its value. And as soon as that is set, um, Doku sort of uh, restarts your application, recompiles everything, redeploys, and everything's pretty sweet. If you want to check and see that your envir environment variable has been set, you can use config get and it will show it. If you just do Doku config technobot, it'll show you all of your environment variables. Um, and I originally had a slide for that there and then realized that my API keys were going to be shown to all of you guys. Um, I trust you, but not that much. <laughs> it's Dar on the video. It's where you can trust us all. But... Okay, except for that Dar guy. It's people from Houston. Um, so the thing that was causing me the biggest trouble, like I spent a lot of time actually writing the code for this like very small application um, and figuring out how to get it deployed. And, I felt pretty comfortable with everything. So the whole point, by the way, is just so that you can do like git push and then, you know, you set up the remote for your application, you git push to that remote and uh, it just gets automatically deployed for you. Um, I didn't really want to, I'd never set up Nginx before and I wasn't really interested in trying to figure all of that out right away. Um, I was just excited that the application seemed to work locally. Um, so uh, I decided I was gonna deploy it with all of this and the midline version. So this was not something that I had ever noticed in any of my project.clj files, but it basically specifies like a minimum version of lining in to use. Um, it's pretty simple and easy to understand why that might be there, um, except when you use the composure template that lining in provides, 
um, it excludes that line. It's it's not in the project CLJ file. You'd have to add it yourself. I had never heard of it, um, and so I didn't have it. So when I went to deploy the application, the uh, I got a really sort of like ridiculous set of errors where it basically went in to install and download all of my dependencies from Clojars and it couldn't find any of them. It was like retrieving and then it went to like look in the directory where they were supposed to have been downloaded to and none of them were there. Um, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me what it was until Norman noticed that when we started to push again, just sort of after trying a million other things, we went and pushed again, um, it said no minline version detected in the project CLJ file. And then it said it was gonna use some old version of landing. It was like one something. Um, and we thought, or he thought really, um, that that must be part of the problem. So we went in, we added the midline version, we said 2.0.0, um, and then magically it works. You just get pushed and the application works. Um, I included this tweet because, although I seem to have cut off the date, uh, Technomancy tweeted this two years ago, so I should have known. <laughs> um, so if I had done my research on, on deploying this, I know it says Heroku, but these are literally like all of Heroku's tools to get it working. So this is highly relevant to what I was trying to do. Um, and so if you're going to push your application on the DigitalOcean or wherever, and you're going to use uh, Doku, make sure that you have that min line version thing in there. Otherwise, what, what was really frustrating about it was that it said, oh, no min line version of the project CLJ file. And then it's like, no problem, we'll just use this other thing. And it's like, all right, you assume that since it was sort of looking for it and didn't find it and had an alternative that everything would be okay, but that is not in fact the case. Everything will not be okay. Your application will not work. Um, so, uh, I have a question yeah, from, sure. uh, from uh, Dara. He said he'd like to know how it takes your deployment to process and if you have to build the Uber work. So, I didn't I didn't build any Uber drivers for it. Uh, but the build pack does. The build pack does, exactly. And that's sort of like what's sweet about it. The whole process, I mean, what actually, you know, we can have a quick look at it. It's a little bit, uh, So if we go to digital, oh, actually, that's why it's not gonna work. Wrong. Rest in peace, Robin Williams. Did everybody see this? It's really awful. Uh, so if we go to DigitalOcean, uh, what's really cool about DigitalOcean is that it actually has, if you wanna create a new droplet, you have to use like the latest version of uh, Ubuntu for it. Um, but basically you set this up, it takes like 30 seconds. Um, you just have to make sure if you don't want to do it yourself, if I can zoom in here, you'll see one of these sweet software packages that DigitalOcean will install for you automatically is Doku. So you can just sort of provision a new droplet with Doku already installed. Um, and then you just have to set up all of your own stuff locally um, in Git. And then once you push, it takes maybe, I mean, I would imagine it depends heavily on the size of your application, but for this it took 20 seconds and then it's up and running so that was pretty cool um so yeah and uh if we want to like ask technobot for a song does any are there any techno fans in the room no all right i'll, I'll pick one uh len fabby uh mihan delta it's a great song we should look it up don't fail me now <laughs> And he doesn't seem to have actually posted. Well, there's the link to it. So if we wanted to listen to it, there it is. But yeah, so that's Technobot. Um, oh, so one other thing I wanted to mention, everybody uses, uh, what is it? I'm blanking out now, I don't know why. What's the uh, editor you all use for this? Emacs. Jesus. Yeah, so I'm like the one person who doesn't use Emacs. I'm like a long time Vim user and I'm big, oh. what? No. <laughs> oh, yes. You can judge me for it. It's okay. Uh, I'm a lowly Vim user. Um, you use it as well? I use it. Right, so we're going to have to talk one day because it took me forever in a day to set up my environment. I'm still not really happy with it. Um, but yeah, Vim is not, it's not super fun uh, for dealing with closure files. None of the cool stuff that you guys have for Emacs. Uh, works properly in Vim, and so I'm constantly trying to like move things around. So if you, sir, please, I beg you, please, like impart some wisdom on me, because I'm a struggling, struggling. Yeah. Are any of the Emacs VI modes plausible as an alternative? 
I would imagine, yeah. Some people. There's two or three built in now. I don't know how good they are though. So uh, people on Reddit, anytime that I post something, like a screenshot of something, and they're like, are you using Vim? And I'm just like, yes. And they're like, why not just use Emacs and Evil Mode? And I'm just like, right. I, I have not ever gotten around to trying it. I, I spent a lot of time in this editor, and I'm kind sure. of married to it at the moment. So, <laughs> so if, uh, but if you have a sweet resource or something, I I'd do. be. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would be smart about Emacs, but I don't know much about the VI. Yeah, so I'm, I'm down to switch. This is the first time that I've actually been like, Vim is driving me crazy. I'm not sure that it's like the perfect environment for me when I write closure. So <laughs> for everything else, I'm pretty good. I'll write an essay uh, in, in Vim if I had to. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, that's sort of my flow with it. Any questions? No? How big was the core of it? It, so it's uh small that's the other thing is that it's really slow um actually why did this <coughs> it's uh small so there it is um there are a few other project files though like none of the the code to interact with youtube is in here um I really like being new to Clojure. I just like there's certain things that I think are like really cool um, that might be sorry for the laser light show. But, <laughs> um, so there's some things that I think are kind of cool that you don't get to do in Ruby or not as nicely in Ruby. Um, and since that's where I spend most of my time, I tr I try to do things that are not very Ruby like or, or just that are completely different. Um, so like here I have this map. Um, where the uh, the keys are YouTube and weather, and the values are functions that are passed back to whatever was looking up the value in the map. And so down here, I uh, this really sort of weird looking function. Um, I process the the user input that that text field in the params and grab out the first word after Technobot and see if it exists in the map. Um, right now, if it doesn't exist in the map, the program has like a null pointer exception and I need to figure something out about that, maybe some default value in the map. Um, I was looking into that yesterday. Um, I found all sorts of uh, weird ways of doing things that I don't fully understand. Like um, there's something going on here with the reader macro that allows you to um, ignore <coughs> like extra um, arguments that are passed in to this function. Um, there were a variety of different ways that it could work, but this one seemed sort of uh, the weirdest, so I thought I'd go with it. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, so yeah, this is it. I mean, if there's another file called YouTube that has some of the YouTube stuff in it, so like this is the the sort of search base for uh, how you would search YouTube using their like G data field, um, and then build the query, basically send it, get the response, deal with all that stuff. Um, I think the uh, is this thread first or thread last? Thread first. I can get thread first. Thank you. I think that's like the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> and so I make heavy use of it all the time whenever I can, <laughs> especially if I have large nested data structures like this huge thing, this huge JSON object that, uh, that YouTube gives back to you with your search results. It's enormous. Um, and so parsing it in Ruby is like not terribly elegant, um, but it's pretty sweet um, enclosure. You just sort of have these two lines here to grab the URL and the title of the video, and there it is. So I actually had a lot of fun tooling around with this and sort of getting everything working. Um, I think the weather one is even shorter. I still don't know, by the way, like how to properly like structure a closure application. Like where, initially I had everything in the core file. Like it was all in there, and then I thought, let me just start moving things around and see where I can put stuff. Maybe that would be a good idea. Maybe not. I don't know. It seems to work so far. I don't really have a problem with it. I do that in Ruby. I have like one class in one file and then move sort of everything around. I keep things organized that way. Um, and so I kind of figured I just put all of the weather stuff into this weather uh, file. And same with the YouTube stuff. So there will be more functions. Um, I've started working on the ability for the students who request songs from Technobot to create playlists that they can then, then hit up Technobot for their, their techno playlists. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of, Dan, Dan's not a huge techno fan, so he's always laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone a techno fan? No, it's pretty much just me. You? <laughs> so you had a question, you're, you're not a techno fan though? Because I may reconsider answering the question. <laughs>
Juno reactor. Do I know reactor? A Juno reactor. Juno reactor. Are they, are they considered guys? I'm not familiar with Juno. <laughs> Where are they from? Hates me. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Um, so, what? I have two questions actually. So, um, can you recap all the the things in the composure template that didn't work for you and uh, luminous template? Um, like, I guess how did what what extra stuff did that that add for you that you didn't want? Just out of curiosity. So the. The Luminous template came with a whole bunch of DB stuff, like Horma and all of that, which actually, now that I've decided I want users to be able to have like playlists and stuff, <laughs> turns out I may actually need it. But I thought maybe I won't use Korma, maybe I'll try something else. Yeah, um, there's a bunch of other Yeah, ones. so, and the Korma, I've used Korma before, because um, I'm rebuilding another web application that I built. Um, and, but Korma like doesn't, doesn't play nice with PostGIS, and that's really kind of frustrating, so I need to figure out something else. Um, so this line here, line 50, sorry again for the uh, light show, I hope you're not epileptic. Um, so line 50 here where it says dev, app, wrap params, app routes. So here are my routes. Um, originally that line read wrap JSON app routes, um, which is not nice <coughs> for what the sort of the, the post request that was coming in. It like formatted it. it was, I didn't like it that way. It was sort of easier to deal with um, if it was just your normal sort of params. Um, and the other thing that the composure template didn't have uh, that was kind of frustrating was this. So I've got it right here. It says the minline version is super important. So <coughs> line 16, it just was not included at all. Um, and so Doku thinks it's being nice by sort of working with you if you don't have it, but then it works with you by using an older version of line that for some reason um, does not find the dependencies properly. Um, and yeah, so with Luminous, there's nothing wrong with Luminous. I actually used Luminous for the other web application I'm rebuilding and quite liked it. It was kind of nice, actually, as somebody new to that, to just be like, here's all the shit you need to make it work. Um, but then it's like, so now Korma is the only thing I know. You know what I mean? So um, I'd like to try something different, basically. So you know, we have suggestions on ORMs or maybe there's not even hop line. What was that? Hoplon. Hoplon. Yeah, that's, that's another one. Cool. I'll check it so, yeah, and part of the reason why I didn't want to use Luminous also for this was that I kind of wanted to, like, when I did the first web application with Luminous, um, it gave me all that stuff, and I sort of, like, figured out which parts of it I needed. And this time I sort of wanted to figure out as I was going, like, what all those libraries really were um, and which parts of them I actually needed. And so slowly but surely I sort of, this didn't really have anything in it except for the ring stuff and composure. Um, and obviously, or closure, um, and that was it. Though everything else, I had just these these three, I had to add in. Um, so I'd kind of like to just do that myself and do the research myself and figure out, you know, what do I need, make some decisions. Okay. Any other questions? Question from Dara. He said, "Does Duku give you the ability to configure your web server, like compressing, caching, stuff like that?" I have no idea. But I would imagine it does. Actually, I'm pretty certain it does because one of the things that I found when trying to figure out why it was working was somebody who had configured it, configured it himself uh, with Nginx. And Doku, like, it, I'm trying to figure out, there's like a, I think it's like etc slash Doku slash vhosts. Um, you can set up all of these domains, um, and Nginx will sort of look there to figure out um, what to serve up where. Um, so yeah, you can actually configure all that stuff yourself, though I haven't done it myself at all. Thanks, By the way, if, if you're on your map, you said you were getting null pointers? Yeah. If you add an extra argument, like a string, after the get, that'll be it. It'll give you that back. After the get? Yeah. yeah. So I need a get, and then your hash. I didn't hash. use get, I just okay. sort of like used this string, well. Okay. Yeah, so, so here's structure. here's the map, and then here's the command, and so I just sort of look it up. But I guess I could use get. And just, yeah, you can use even, get. Even using a map as a function, you can do the same thing. If you just add a second argument, you'll, you'll get that as the So just function. like, not there, I know. Like that. Yeah. All right. Sweet. That actually is pretty helpful. So thanks, dude. Yeah, or just store the return function in the let. That would be to like if let. If nothing came back from that. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Cool. Thanks. Thanks so, I.
actually only came tonight because I wanted to hear about Oxcart. I really wanted to do my own presentation. So uh, I'm looking forward to this part of yeah. So right. let's do it. Thanks for presenting. I sent a full request to uh, Composure Template for you. So. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I should have done that myself. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was afraid it was so easy that you might actually do it. So I, <laughs> I, I, I had to do it first. <laughs> All right, let's see. Hopefully nothing exploded. Okay, looks like we're still alive here. So I'm going to try and fix my mirroring first. So I'm actually doing display mirroring and I can see what I'm talking about rather than doing something funky. Good, nice. All right, so we're gonna kick you back off since Cider's not playing nicely today and we'll move you away. All right, so um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Reed McKenzie. I was a Google Summer Code student this summer. Uh, my project was Oxcart, uh, an experimental ahead of time compiler for Clojure. Um, this is in some ways a preview of my talk proposal to Closure Conj, and this talk comes with a couple apologies up front. Um, first off, I have not had the opportunity to rehearse this specific quote unquote slide set because Dropbox ate, Dropbox ate my real slides. So I will be presenting from raw Emacs org mode with bopping around, bopping around back and forth between a bunch of different source files and some REPLs. Um, the other apology is that I am at present an academic and I have done a bunch of research reading and stuff. So I'm probably going to assume at some point that you guys know something about just-in-time compilers or normal compilers or the closure runtime, you may not. I am deliberately going to do a run through of the relevant bits of closure core to this project, but please, if I am talking fast, if I'm talking about something I haven't explained, if you're just confused, or if I just seem lost, please flag me down and ask a question or warn me or something because this is gonna be fun. So without further ado, let's see. Right, so I'm a UT. I've done research in compilers, in software engineering, and in computer architecture, so my background on this talk is that I got to work on Niccolo Memento's project Closure and Closure, which is an attempt, this is the Tools Analyzer and Tools Emitter JVM contrib libraries for those of you who have seen those projects before. These are part of an attempt to write a compiler for Closure that can run inside of Closure itself and it works, which is pretty awesome and has enabled some really cool projects that I will talk about at length later. Um, <coughs> Thanks to Timothy Baldridge, who was my mentor and Nicola's mentor in building all this stuff. He is with Cognitect and is the perpetrator of the core async Go macro. Um, and, Nic and Nicola Mometo, who built most of this infrastructure last year as part of Google Summer of Code. So basically, to get started here, we're going to go through some messy bits of closure and bits that you've probably seen in stack traces but may not have understood and probably weren't relevant to you in any way, shape, or form at the time. So traditionally, in a programming language, right, you have a function, and a function really means it's a block of bytecode, right? It's some sequence of instructions that the, comp that the CPU executes one at a time for side effects on memory, on registers, on hardware, right? And you can have a pointer to some point in your program, right? This means that in C, you can abuse this and get a function pointer to a raw memory address, right? So here I have a say hello function, and it just says printf hello world, and I'm going to actually treat it as a memory address, assign it, and then call it through the pointer, right? And this is totally legitimate. So if you look at scheme compilers and how other functional languages are implemented, 
you see this function pointer style all over the place because this is how you get functions as values, right? A bytecode function is not a value. You can't move it around. Intel hardware won't let you jump into some arbitrary point in memory. You need to have a pre-compiled function, more or less, and then you tell the CPU where you want to go in that pre-compiled code. And passing around the address of that pre-compiled code is how you achieve this. In Clojure, we're on the JVM. And we don't have code except for methods, right? So the JVM doesn't have a concept of a method pointer. That means we can't do this. So what we wound up with is I function objects, right? So let's see if I can just bop this buffer, buffer open. So we have closure lang I function. Right? And I functions are what your code compiled down to. So when you say call f with two arguments, right, the bytecode this comes out to is dot invoke of an instance of f with two arguments on the stack, right? So you will actually have some special case instance of invoke that only implements part of the interface, right? And the reason you get um, real usable error when you error out is that you're not actually implementing I function directly. You're really subclassing closure line A function that has all these nice throw error exceptions. So if you shoot yourself in the foot, the bytecode is there to catch you already. And this is all built for you in closure core. So the reason this matters is you'll notice that these are all public object invoke, right? The not public static object. This means that you need to have an instance of your function in order to be able to do anything to this, right? Because you're passing a function around as a value. You're not staying statically, this is the guy I want to use, go call him. This is going to be significant once I introduce vars, which are the next thing on the list. Okay, and I skipped a bit, of course. The reason we need functions are twofold. Not only can we not have real function pointers, or method pointers, but we need to be able to put metadata on functions, which means that we get an I object that we can stick metadata on. And for closures, if you have a function that has an anonymous function inside of it, how do you actually compile that? It turns out that you create a class for each one of those functions, and the one that closes over the other creates an instance of the closed over function and uses that instance. And you can't do that without this class structure. So. Can you repeat that? Okay. If you write fn x, right? Sure. And you have f of y inside of that. I'm sorry, I'm completely blocking this. Let me just type it. <laughs> I got scratch, but the font's tiny. All right. If you have fn of x and fn of y, right, and you're going to have plus xy, so you're just going to partially apply addition on x and then actually evaluate it on y and return that result. The way this is going to compile down is you're going to pull this guy out, right? This guy closes over x. This is not an argument to the function. So what this means is when you actually create your instance of this inner function to return it, that instance is going to need an instantiation parameter. That's going to be the x value. And so part of why we need functions as objects is to support closed over fields like this. Because you need to be able to say, I'm going to close over some value from the outside environment. That needs to be an instantiation parameter on this object. Everybody else good? Have I lost you yet? Lost you. Okay. I was going to be lost. Uh, so, some, something I can do to help with that. No, no, I'm just trying to. So, so, so out of curiosity, was the, I mean, was invoke dynamic off the table because closure just doesn't work that way right now? Invoke dynamic is work that somebody else is already doing. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, invoke dynamic is a relatively new JVM bytecode instruction 
that allows you to specify a check operation and a fast path. So the idea is that you can quickly see if the code you're going to call has changed. So if I say, let's clear this out here. If I say def foo, right, or def foo of x, and we're going to have plus x3, because I like addition, it's easy to do quickly, def in g of y, we're just going to say times foo of y5 or something, right? When we run this, when we call g, right, so let's say we say g of 4. What this is going to do, and I'll explain this in more detail later, is this is going to go get the var g and go get the var foo and call those vars. So I will take this as an opportunity to segue through to the var explanation and get and circle back to this. Who here has seen closure line var pop up in a stack trace before? You have? You have? Okay. So we, we've actually, some of you have actually managed to blow up core. So the big idea with vars is pretty simple. <clears throat> and apparently I can't zoom that in anymore, so I apologize. Static images could be better in Emacs. The idea with vars is that you have a namespace object that's mutable. And it represents the set of definitions that occur in a namespace. And then that namespace is a mapping from strings, symbols, to var objects. And var is this atomic primitive that's part of Clojure's core implementation. So it's, <coughs> an, it's a ref, it's an I function, it's a settable, and it's got this thread box. But the big thing is that it's got this frame, right? So it has this final static frame top. And so frame is a set of defs, so a binding from a symbol to a value, right? And what vars do is vars provide a binding stack. So you have this big global mutable environment that's thread safe and synchronized and all that good stuff. And then each thread has its own sub stack. So you can create local bindings that don't alter the global bindings. This is what the closure core with bindings macro does. Is it push it forces new bindings into a local thread frame and then throws them away once you're done. So this is where Semerik's um, warning about bindings comes into play. He's a, he explains here, let's see if that uh, Oh, right, capital factory is giving me nasty about this, forget it. He explains that because partial, sorry, because lazy sequences are evaluated when you force them, not when you declare them, bindings are about in lazy sequences are evaluated when you force them, not when you declare them. So if you have a lazy sequence, if you have a lazy sequence inside the with bindings form, and you're depending on some custom binding that you set, that binding isn't actually gonna do anything until you force the lazy sequence. So the warning is that you must force your lazy sequences inside of binding forms because otherwise it'll blow up like this. You'll return out of the lazy sequence, out of the binding form, and then force the lazy sequence somewhere else, and suddenly you don't have your binding anymore and your code behaves unexpectedly. So those are vars quickly. And then the compiler. So Clojure is a compiled language, but it's important to note that the compiler is per form. It's not per file. And this is how we have a read eval print loop. When you say Clojure lang compiler <coughs> compile, you give it a single expression, a single top level form. And you say generate bytecode for this form. And this is important because it means that you, the language itself supports single form evaluation for REPLs, right? Because if you have a file, you have a bunch of forms, you're going to do them all in order, right? But if you have a REPL, you want to be able to load the next, compile the next form, and then force it into the environment. So you need to be able to do single form compilation 
rather than saying, hey, I'm a C programmer and I need to recompile my whole application to make a single change. That makes sense? And we have mutable bindings in addition to mutable namespaces. And this is again how we get REPL interaction. Because if you want to redefine foo, if you've already defined foo, you need to be able to create a new var that alters the existing var binding of the foo symbol and go from there. All good so far? Okay. So, put it all together. Closure Lang RT implements everything in the Closure Core library set in terms of Closure Core and the compiler. Closure Lang RT includes, so technically it compiles, the Closure Core file itself. And this means that if you use any of the data structures in Closure Core without having already loaded the Closure Core runtime itself, so the actual Closure language, the RT library will load the whole language, compile it, define all the bars in it, and act just like you'd spin up a REPL, even though all you did was try to create an instance of an A persistent hash map or something else. And this is a feature, actually, when you're interacting with Clojure from Java. If you have a Clojure application, you want to say, hey, go make something, go use a Clojure core function. You need to have, the, the Clojure core library needs to have silently done this. That or it needs to impose upon you the manual initialization step. And as of Clojure 1.6, there is no longer a manual initialization step. So this is technically a feature. But what it means is that we have this big block of classes that load each other, and in the case of the Clojure compiler and the Clojure core, actually compiles new bytecode and installs it in your runtime <coughs> when you boot a Clojure instance to build this dynamically compiled, dynamically type checked, dynamically dispatched mess that we love to use every day. Okay? So this is the big picture of Clojure core as it stands. So Nicola Momento last year started working on Clojure and Clojure. So the compiler is not very friendly if you go and read it. I could actually click that link and go pull up the compiler buffer and count lines for you, but it's something on the order of 3,000 lines long or more, and probably a quarter of that is code that is commented out in place. And the indentation's a mess, and it uses mutable vars for environments. So this is not something you can just pick up and read or pick up and hack on. I do not understand the normal compiler myself. I tried and then I stopped because Tools Emitter works and Tools Emitter is much nicer to work with. So the idea with the Clojure and Clojure project was to build a simpler compiler that was written in Clojure that a normal human being that's not Rich Hickey or Stuart Holloway can actually understand and hopefully make something that you can hack on and improve reasonably without being either of the above two rock stars. So, Nicola, last year, built Tools Analyzer, Tools Analyzer JVM, and Tools Emitter JVM. Tools Analyzer is a library that does form-by-form -form analysis of closure programs. So if you type out something like this let expression down here, and I will actually demo this in a minute, Tools Analyzer is a toolkit that lets you say, oh hey, this use of X is a local binding created by this outer binding creating let. And it exposes this in terms of a really nice hash map, map-based AST that you can muck with using the wonderful thread-first macro, along with some other stuff. Um, Tools Analyzer JVM specializes Tools Analyzer to handle JVM interop. So it'll resolve classes and host calls and all that other good stuff. And Tools Emitter JVM is a closure compatible or normal closure compiler compatible emitter that's built on top of all of this. And this is all Nicholas heroic work from last year, which I got to build the top of this year. So also if you've used these tools, Core Async, Eastwood, or Core Tight, you have been a client of Nicholas code because all of these rely on Tools Analyzer in one form or another to do the analysis that they're built on top of. So let's see if I can grab a CIDR REPL. Um, and 
demo all this for you. Or it might be difficult. Okay. You guys gonna be picky and demand that I do this live or shall I just show you the pre-evaluated example and move on with it? The canned results. All right, pre-canned results it is. So if given the same example, right? We're just gonna evaluate, we're just gonna try and describe a let form. What does a let look like if you run it through Tools Analyzer? The answer is you get back a big frickin' map, right? So it is a let operation and it has a bindings chill child and the body child, and this is the macro expanded source form, right? And so the binding is, we have a binding operation and it has an initial value, that's a constant one, right? Which is consistent with our initial let. And then we have a body, that's a do block, that has statements, we don't have any statements, and we have a ref. Yeah, why are you no scrolling? Now you're scrolling suddenly. Hello. Lost my own presentation. Okay. We have body that has statements, but only has one statement, and that's the red of this local form, right? So it is very easy from this. So, for instance, a var, right? I can pop this open. A var in this would be op var um, children in it, and then in it would be some other node, some single node that describes the value you're going to put in the var. And it actually, you'll have in it and you'll have metadata as long as along with some other stuff. Um, and you have op invoke that has children. Um, fn and args that are self-explanatory and then you have a function that's a single node and a sequence of nodes that are children for the arguments and on down the line. And this makes it very easy from a tree traversal point of view to interact with this because if I want to say start from this node, walk all the children and just give me back the ones that are vars right, or that are invokes or lets, I can totally do that. It's just a simple depth first traversal and Tools Analyzer has built in tools for implementing that traversal over the Tools Analyzer AST. So this is really a joy to work with in a lot of ways and totally made my life easy. Um, so uh, my apologies for gushing about it, but I think it's pretty sweet. All right, so, um, TJVM demo. Let's see if I can pull this off. Or my window manager is going to be weird. Okay, well, I have a REPL, but it's clipping where I can't see it. So I'm going to call this one a bust. Tools Emitter JVM does what you think it does and it takes one of these fully analyzed ASTs and builds bytecode for it. And it's really nice about doing so because it's just a big multi-method, which means that you can totally read it and understand what it's doing. Let's see if I can grab the link up here. So, on to the bit that you came here for, Oxcart, having demonstrated Nicola's work badly. Um, the big picture here is I'm interested in compiler's research, and I like Clojure, and so the natural consequence of this was that I tried to hack on Clojure this summer, and I got to. So, from the JVM's JIT point of view, var represents a memory wall. What does this mean? It, because var has a mutable, sorry, not mutable, what is it? It's transient or something? Volatile. Volatile. Thank you. Always get the one wrong. Um, because the value of a var is volatile, the JVM's inliner will stop when it sees that you're going through this volatile field. 
because that volatile field could be anything on the, on the other side, right? It could be updated anywhere. You can't legally cache it. And so the JVM just doesn't bother. And so the big picture of Oxcart was, well, what happens if we can get around this volatile field, right? What happens if we can get around VARs altogether? Because usually we write mostly static programs, right? You don't actually go around rebinding VARs all the time. In some rare cases, and I actually have a few of them myself, you do. But for the most part, it's safe to assume that defs are final. And this lets us do static linking that escapes VARs and escapes the mutable, sorry, volatile root for performance win, hopefully. So that's all this. It also lets us do other cool stuff because it means we can do tree shaking. That means that if we can prove statically that you don't use eval and you don't use a var in your code, we can throw it away. We don't need to emit bytecode for it, right? In closure, if you emit, if you define something, you could have a map that's three gig large and you never use it. But at load time, it will be built because the closure compiler doesn't do any analysis to try and figure out what's used and what isn't. So it'll just sit there for no good reason. The same is obviously true of functions, but you know, a function's only a couple K or less, so who cares these days? But in theory, this is a nice property. It also means that we can throw away metadata. So if you look at a profile of loading closure core, most of your time is spent initializing vars and loading var metadata, which is for the most part, not something you're gonna look at, right? Because who's introspecting closure core in a deployed application? Probably nobody here. Um, I am because I'm deploying a compiler, but that's a very rare case. Um, this means that we can throw away metadata on most vars if we can prove it's not going to be used. And we can throw away most of Clojure Core, in theory, if we can prove it's not going to be used. Although this is something that I can't actually do, um, and I already explained to you why, but I'll circle back to that in the limitations section. So the big idea here is we have vars that implement both static bindings and dynamic bindings. We have with local vars that lets you create an anonymous var that you can muck with yourself. And you have big global vars that you def. And so you have one data structure that serves two purposes. And in both of these purposes, it is using big, a big hunk of global mutable state to do it at a performance loss. So we want to throw those away wherever we can. So Oxcart says, Hang on a second, your defs are now static, right? If you have multiple defs, the last one wins, and I don't care that you ever had a different value for this. We're just gonna ignore it. So this means that we can ignore load order, we can do all kinds of other stuff, and finally, we can create an invoke static concept, right? We don't need to have an actual instance of this thing to invoke anymore. We can just say, here's a bunch of bytecode, I know where it is, I promise you it's never ever going to change, go run it. And this, the JVM will happily do and happily do fast. So in order to do this, we need to do some stuff. Lambda lifting is one instance of this. Um, there's also some use analysis that I do that's apparently not in here. Um, the big idea with lambda lifting is if you have a closed over function like I showed you earlier, right? So if we have fn of x and fn of y, and we're going to do our same plus x, y example. Normally in closure, this is how, you know, as I explained, you're going to have to instantiate the inner function with the closed over values from the outer one, and then return that value. Lambda lifting is the process of saying, wait, we're going to raise this inner function above the outer one. So we're going to recognize that this x is a closed over value from the outer environment, and we're just going to be quiet about it and stick it here on your function arguments where you don't see it. And we're going to hoist f, the inner function, out, make it a real function, and rewrite the other guy in terms of foo gen sim 3000 or something, right, of x. Because that's really what's going on here. Does that make sense? And what this lambda lifting lets us do is it lets us say, 
suddenly we no longer have closed over defs. You no longer have this little inner function guy. Man, this is just turning out terribly in terms of the display. Do you have an overscan setting in your driver? In your Quite possibly. Too much trouble to set. The yeah. It's fine. Just a single character. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so your, your Fujen Sim 300 yeah. only has one argument. Where's the... Uh, oh. Huh. Right. You have to hoist the inner argument out as well. So that'll actually get rewritten like that, I think. Yeah, because you have VARG, so you need to prepend it. Um, and then this actually will get rewritten in place, if possible. Um, right? Anyway. This, but this is the idea with lambda lifting. Because we are using wrapped defs, wherever possible, we're going to lift them out. And by lifting them out, we can emit a static class for them that we can statically link against rather than trying to create an instance of them in place with parameters and then manipulate that instance. So let's see if I can bop over here and fix. What's the easiest way to do this? Um, While you're doing that, why when you when you pop those out, does that enable you to generate bytecode that'll jump to the label? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we can do we can do bytecode that jumps in our functions. I have an experimental module that doesn't work that actually will generate lifted functions for every arity of your function. So if I can statically determine your arity rather than having an invoke that does arity dispatch or an apply that does arity dispatch. I will actually just hard link straight to the correct arity, cool. having lifted the def. And then the main, the def that you actually had then becomes invokes of lifted methods. And you can potentially, in some cases where you don't take that def as a value, then tree shake it out. Because if you don't actually, if you rewrite all uses by arity, then only uses by value remain and you can throw away the main one. Um, bump it. Okay. Well, I apologize. I'm going to insist on doing this one demo because it's freaking running the compiler end to end for Hello World. And it may be a bit of a pain to get working. So I'm going to say clean run um, test dot hello. Where am I? Oh, of course, I've used my laptop in months. So this is an out of date Oxford version. So we're locking this guy at 1900 by 1600 by 900. And is that an option down here? No. So we'll just be lame. I'll grab 1020. Going old school. Yep. <sighs> And this is why you should never present from Linux, mm -hmm. because terrible things happen and things that should just work like AirPlay don't. As I'm fighting my own computer shamefully, any other questions? With the, the tree shaking algorithms? Yeah. Are you basing them on older list ones or are you looking at Smalltalk and Haskell and some of the other ones? Um, most of 
the tree shaking algorithm is the is the obvious one, and it's it's probably the same one that was used in all of those optimizers, because really all I'm doing is I'm computing the reach set of depths. So the, I'm, I'm okay. So now that I actually can see what I'm doing on this computer at least, let's see if I can grab some code for you. Doc hobby programming lang closure me artem ox cart. Sure, fine, newt. Bit, right. Energy. Get pull. Okay, get tag. And we should show right. Yeah, there are some bad tag names in there, but we'll go with it. Okay, so if I switch these. That's the wrong height and you can't see it. Sorry. <sighs> okay, so we're, we're just going to force my display LVDS. The same mode that you guys are seeing. And that's awful. I just worked my computer. God damn it. Yeah, this is what I was afraid of. You might be able to just flip the Emacs window horizontally, use that, and use a terminal inside. Oh, hello. It looks like it's healed itself. <laughs> there we go. There you go. All right. Let's give it Better? Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Da, copy, programming, lang, closure, me, artem, ox card, source, bench, closure, test, hello. All right. Blood closure. All cider, please. Okay. Hello, world. Look reasonable to everybody present. Right, we're just going to do the obvious thing. So if we're going to shell. It's all expanded out just for no. It's expanded out for no good reason. The. I mean, it's not a requirement of what you're Yeah, the, 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 the tools analyzer library does macro expanding. So I could have written that by hand, but I deliberately used system print line calls because otherwise it'll go through RT or it'll use the closure line, it'll use closure core print line, which is a var, and I just wanted to ignore all of that stuff and do a bytecode print line if I could. So if I say lean run um, test on hello, that's the wrong one. So we wrote a couple classes, and we should be able to, once this thing decides to exit, I'm not sure it's up with Oxcart, but for some reason it hangs the JVM prior to exiting. And if I control C it, it seems to not flush the buffers correctly. So, yeah, I need to do that in main. I'm not. I'm also, also not. So, both closure and the JVM won't flush standard open the standard error by default. So yeah, which, which, is, which is additionally cool. All right, screw it. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to risk my luck here. So, we're going to say um, Java, tax CP, lean CP. So, we can get the class path from line again and run it. And test.hello is our class. So we're going to spin up a line instance and get the class path and then run Java and ran hello world. So I can at least compile something. Cool. So the real test here is the, do I have the bench var script? Right. So this is going to take forever and I will run it later once I've finished the rest of the talk. Um, but this, this is, 
This was kind of that I made it and it works because by default tools emitter JVM does not have loading infrastructure so you can't actually use it to do edit ahead of time comp compilation. So this was the I've done AOT, I've loaded a program, and I've spat out class files that you can just run and win. Um, so, 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 so how big is it? Is is that hello dot class? I mean, you, it really it really doesn't it doesn't have a bunch of other junk in there. I'm just curious. I see if I'm understanding what you're doing. So I, I I'll actually let me load up my um, JVM bytecode explorer. Oh, okay, that's even better. Um, <laughs> six hundred thirty-one. Yeah, local, and then this is Java P handler. Okay, so load that up. Closure. So target classes test hello. All right, so hello.class isn't really that interesting. This is actually really small as far as closure class files go. Because all this is doing, can, is this legible at all? Yeah. All this is going to do is it's going to say, okay, make a new instance of the test hello main class and install the only var in the whole program. Just in case, I haven't actually. I, I still emit vars, and the re, and the rationale for this is because I'm going to do this closure lang R, rt call. I hooked into rt, and the first thing rt does when you load it in the JVM is it compiles all of closure core. So there's nothing I can do to escape compiling closure core unless I hard fork the whole bloody language and edit rt myself. And I just haven't done that yet. Um, that may be something I do this week, though, since I'm now on extra fun stuff I could possibly do. So the big picture is we're going to make a new hello, we're going to load the arguments, and then ultimately we're going to call the apply. So we're going to seek the argument stack, and then we apply the main class instance, and we pop and just return. And that's it. So the main class is where the fun happens. And it's a little bit more interesting because we have it knows its own name and it knows that it's going to be an oxlang ASFN. <coughs> and I'll explain that in a minute here. And then finally down here at the bottom, so we have an, we have an init, and all this does is this just initializes the constant fields. So we have a constant value that's the um, Java Lang system, <coughs> and we have our own name, and we have to do the superclass call, constructor call, because the JVM doesn't give that to you for free. So invoke static is weirdness that I had to add because it's not in Closure Core anywhere. Prior to Enclosure 1.3, Rich added invoke static. And as I mentioned earlier, invoke is not public static, and invoke static is public static. So all this does is this is a zero arity case of calling this thing, and I have to have an invoke because that's how apply to works. So this is a function instance, same fun kind of function you'd normally see from Closure Core, and I apply it to a sequence of zero arguments. And the apply to zero arguments recognizes that it has no arguments and calls the zero arity case, which calls the invoke static above for this particular customized implementation of apply to, where I know that I have a static function that I can invoke static on. Um, and so invoke static does the obvious thing. It just grabs the print stream buffer, pushes hello world onto the stack, prints it, and then system exits zero, having used closure lang RT to cast an int to a long because closure lang likes everything to be a long. So, yeah, well, that's technically a long to an int, but same idea. So this, this is all that the hello world comes down to. And note that there is actually no var involved here. 
So the only case, the only place that I had the var was in Maine when I just installed all the vars anyway because I'm going to load RT anyway, and I may as well have vars because it doesn't actually bind anything to tree shake them out at this point, unfortunately. So that's the that's the bike code demo of what I built this summer. Um, <coughs> That was the Hello World demo. So looking forwards. Right now, because we're REPL targeted language and we support dynamic redefinition, we have omnipresent var and direction, right? You, if you look at the, if you <coughs> decompile normal closure code, you will never actually see a static call right now. You will always see that you take the var, you, you push the namespace as a string, you push the symbol as a string, you say closure lang RT, get var that gets the var that binds the, that namespace string pair and you get a value out of that and then you invoke that value. Now what this means is if you go write a new def you don't have to recompile everything else because the var structure has been updated in place mutably and getting the var and invoking it will just work. Right? That's the whole, that's the whole beauty of the var structure. The compiler is literally brain dead. All it does is emit push namespace, push symbol, get var, invoke for everything. Doesn't have to do any analysis, doesn't have to do any constant folding, doesn't have to do anything at all. It's the simplest compiler that could possibly work and because the var structure saves it the, the duty of doing all this other analysis, it can be really, really simple as these things go. So. Right now, closure is slow for a couple reasons. Var indirection turns out really not to matter. When I compile, when I run the test program that compares a var indirection mashing closure program again, compiled with Oxcart against a var mashing program compiled with closure 1.7, I see a 24% speed up from Oxcart. I mean, it, it's nothing, it's not earth shattering. It's not like I pulled a 5x out of thin air. This tells me that the var is a worthwhile trade-off. The ability to do dynamic redefinition and <coughs> update your dispatch dynamically is totally worth a 24% slowdown in my book. And there is work in the 1.7 branch from a couple different people that was probably going to add like a 15% performance improvement just in 1.7 from Invoke Dynamic, along with some other that, stuff. That is happening. There is some work on Invoke Dynamic, and Rich has pulled Invoke Static back out of nowhere. So if you look at Closure Core, let me see, I can actually have a file link up <coughs> to it here somewhere. Uh, doc, hobby, programming line, closure, org, closure, closure, CLJ, closure core. If you ever looked at core, and I recommend it, it's kind of fun, you'll see that most of this stuff. <laughs> has metadata that says static true. And in closure 1.3, that actually meant something. That meant that the compiler would emit a invoke static target for normal closure functions, same as Oxcart now does. And if when you used a static function from a static function, you wouldn't do a var. You would just do purely static linking, which was a win a little bit, but it turns out that totally breaks REPL development. Because if you ever redefine something that you tagged as static, nothing that used it statically gets updated. And this means you start getting really, really interesting bugs in your REPL because you're using two different versions of the same code. So, to bop back down here. Ah, did I die? I died. Can you go back? Okay. <coughs> So RT is he pretty heavyweight because it loads Closure Core and because it initializes Closure Core and it initializes all of Closure Core's metadata. So there are other projects from this year's GSOC that try to build a lightweight Closure Core that doesn't have metadata on anything or that only lazily loads metadata and tries to <coughs> other tricks to improve load speed, this being all towards trying to support Closure on Android. Um, we use pervasive persistent data structures 
This means that from a CPU perspective, our cache performance is trash, even by the standards of JVM applications, because we don't do any updates in place besides VARs and atoms. <laughs> um, and we do pervasive checking, casting, and bytecode, which really isn't that bad, but it still counts for something, so it's on the slide. So the big hope of Closure and Closure was my project, try throwing out VARs. Turns out to be not worth the effort. Um, Lean RT, which is Alexander and Rich's summer project. Well, Alexander did it once, and Rich is doing it again for no apparent reason. Um, <coughs> compiler induced transient, introduced transients. This is a whole program optimization that's well beyond the scope of Closure Core, but something that a big static compiler like Oxcart could do. So this is saying, I can prove that you are effectively only updating this data structure in place, you may as well just update it in place. So rather than having to manually handle transients like you do now, you can just write normal ASOCs and the compiler can figure it out and add them. Or add the transient ASOC and the transient conversion back to a persistent data structure. Um, there's also some interesting possibilities in terms of using typed closure to actually type emitted bytecode. And so in addition to having invoke primitive and some other stuff, you could perceivably have, or you could possibly have an invoke typed, where you actually have a typed closure inferred type signature on your bytecode, rather than doing check casts and, have, and handling all these failure cases. Um, closure and closure as a whole, not just my own work. There is no a, there's no ahead of time loader that works yet. Um, this is something I will probably wind up working on because Nicola hasn't built it yet and probably isn't going to build it. Um, there have only been two undergrads that work on this. Who here is willing to write production code built on two undergrads' work? I thought not. So that's clearly a limitation of this code base. I think it's pretty, considering there were two undergrads who worked on it for two summers, and Nicola actually got funded by the core, the core typed Kickstarter to work on it this past school year as well, it's pretty solid. But it's definitely not production grade, and it needs more work. Also, Tools Analyzer is bloody slow. It's 15 times slower to load Closure Core using Tools Analyzer and Tools Emitter JVM than it is to just run it with the normal Closure compiler. And this is completely unacceptable because it means that while Tools Analyzer will work for just REPL work, booting your Closure rep instance in the first place just got a factor of 15 slower, which means that until this comes down to like a factor of two, there's no way this work is going to wind up in Closure Core itself. So I think this has been an this is an interesting experiment. Um, if there's interest and I haven't talked to yours off already, I will be happy to recap my end of summer blog post um, that I think sums this up nicely and comes to the conclusion that Oxcart was a waste of time because Closure just really wasn't designed to benefit from what Oxcart tries to do. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. Thank you for your call. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were I don't know, it might be related to some of this, and maybe you would know. Has there been much work uh, trying to identify or create a sort of core for closure of essentially the platform specific functions you need if you're going to import it somewhere? So, because I worked on Closure C a little yeah. bit and I've toyed with some other stuff, and of course that would be nice. Right. Um, this comes back to the issue that. Tim Baldridge and I talked about and I addressed in my end of summer blog post. What is Clojure, right? Ultimately, Clojure is not a language specification. Right. It's a language implementation built by Rich with no spec for a specific platform with specific data structures in mind. And one of those data structures is VARs. And the whole thrust of Clojure as a language is to make a bunch of trade-offs to make REPL development nice and still performant. But the thing is, you also, I can easily see how there are a lot of times where fine, I had a REPL I was developing, but now I'm not anymore. And to your point of the work you've been doing here, I'd like to apply even something as high as like Stalin level analysis, even if it takes three hours to compile. Absolutely. Analysis. And, and, I, and I personally, I think it'd be really cool to go build that. But, and that's what I started working on this summer, but we're not there. Right. And I, and I think the conclusion of this project is because Closure has so much internal mutable state 
and is so designed towards making REPL work friendly, closure is not really the language that either of us is looking for. I think the upshot of this is closure script is much better because closure script is designed for whole language and whole program compilation, right? Um, closure script also has some nice cleanups to closure core and that everything's built in terms of protocols rather than host interrupt to RT. Um, so you think maybe that's a better place to start? Yeah. yeah so I know that's why Closure C was built that way to begin. Yeah. I think if what you really want is a static version of Closure, then what you really want to do is you want to take Closure script and port it to a different target. And I think that that's probably the best place to start, although I'm playing with some other ideas based on Mike Andera's work on the KISS language. Um, that's a, a more static closure still for the JVM that does different stuff that I will okay. talk about later because it's not relevant to this. Um, yeah, I mean, because one of the problems I've recognized <coughs> are places where, at least for the JVM, one of the big problems for deployment is the startup time. Uh, you can't use it for a command line application, at least right. not one that's bad, it needs to be bad. And you, and you also can't use it for Android right now because or, yeah, just, just booting a closure runtime loads several hundred vars, most of which you'll never use, and just burns user time and blocks the UI. Closure script, though, it, work, it does work great. Like, even on, um, I've used it on Firefox OS, and it's been fine. Other questions? Otherwise, I will stop talking to yourself. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you.